guess that's why we're losing. Now, with an appointment like Jeff Sessions, an unreconstructed neo-Confederate, Donald Trump is making it clear that his administration is going to be a homecoming for white supremacists. When he sits here and decides that Steve Bannon should be his, basically, a cabinet secretary without portfolio, because that's what he is, he's going to play Kissinger to Trump's Nixon. He's sending a powerful message. The man who no Senate, no House of Representatives has any hand in confirming is going to be standing by the president. And what does Steve Bannon believe? Well, you can hear some of his insipid little speeches on YouTube. I would caution you to keep an air sickness bag on standby. But it's exactly what you'd expect, the usual tripe from one of the slightly more sanitized good old boys. However, you gotta give President Tangerine some level of credit if he's gonna decide to surround himself with a bunch of hardcore white supremacists. He definitely didn't do a halfway job of it. He found the hardest hardcore that he possibly could. This is what's coming down the pike in just a little over a month. See, you thought that white supremacy was on the ropes, and we were telling you that this was merely half time. Now it's time for the second half to begin. A couple of weeks ago, Jason and I did a joint broadcast on the blackchannel.net where we talked about Roland Martin's half-assed interview with Richard Spencer. Now, if you don't know who Richard Spencer is, congratulations, you have voted yourself off the island. When the race war starts in earnest in the streets, you will be the cannon fodder who gets picked off first. Please feel free to log off this channel now. You're not wanted here. In intelligent black society, we make it a point to know our enemies. That's how you get victory. By knowing more about your enemy than your enemy knows about you. Though for the one or two people who might have honestly become ignorant of who Richard Spencer is, this is who Richard Spencer is. Richard Spencer is a white supremacist who coined the term alt-right. The reason that he created the term alt-right was because, as he put it, he felt that white nationalist was a term that was too emotionally charged. So when people say alt-right, that's just code for white supremacist. That's who Richard Spencer is. Steve Bannon lauded the website Breitbart, which had already been a sewer of white supremacy, he lauded Breitbart under his stewardship as being the home of the alt-right, a platform for the alt-right. And then Steve Bannon went on to describe Richard Spencer as being one of the thought leaders of the alt-right. By now you've probably seen Richard Spencer holding his Nazi rally at that restaurant in New York. That's the way these guys get down. And you probably want, want to read some more of Richard Spencer's insipid little writings, but back to Roland Martin's pointless debate with Richard Spencer. Aside from the fact that Roland Martin seemed to be completely and thoroughly oblivious to the fact that Richard Spencer was using all of these white code phrases when he was sitting there saying, oh, I believe that slavery was a disaster. Whoa, hold on. Remember, you go to these white supremacist websites, what they tell you is slavery was a disaster because it brought the Negro here. They say slavery was a tragedy because it brought the Negro here. Roland Martin's not familiar with white supremacy speech. He's not familiar with the white supremacist talking points. And apparently wasn't too familiar with his own, for that matter. So it doesn't surprise me that that flew right over Roland Martin's head. But something else that also got me during the interview, Richard Spencer was not concerned with whether or not Roland Martin kicked him around like a freaking soccer ball. Because Richard Spencer did a follow-up interview, and I'm not going to give any sort of publicity to the, to the channel that it was on, but he gave a follow-up interview 
where he said that it's worth more to him to be able to go on television because the people who like his message, who are sympathetic to the white supremacist cause, they don't care whether or not he's made to look like a fool or not. They don't care what the detractors and opponents of white supremacy have to say. In other words, he knows full well that the white supremacists have created a fact-free bubble for white people to exist inside of should they choose to partake, and many of them have. He admittedly has helped to pioneer a subculture, emphasis on the sub part, in which the entire goal is to insulate the people in it from facts, from data, from reality. It's supposed to be nothing more than a white psychological masturbatory orgy, and they have been doing exactly that. Richard Spencer is proud of the fact that he's been able to get on television because as far as he's concerned, he's forcing the powers that be to have to reckon with him. As Richard Spencer put it, two years ago, nobody knew who he was and nobody cared. But now he's being talked about and mentioned on practically all the mainstream media outlets. From ABC to CNN to, to the New York Times and the Washington Post, as far as he's concerned, this is the kind of publicity that the white supremacists previously could not have bought themselves. And he is not concerned with whether or not he loses a debate. As he put it, the goal is to reach as many people and let them know that this movement is out there. Let as many white people know that this movement is out there as possible. Because the more people who see it, the more followers they attract. That's what it's about to Richard Spencer. That's what Roland Martin didn't understand. See, what Jason and I were trying to get some of you to understand is this. Whether or not Roland Martin can score a few rhetorical points against an admitted dimwit like Richard Spencer is irrelevant. If Roland Martin really wanted to be the voice of black people against white supremacy, then he needed to be having interviews with people like Loretta Lynch and, and demanding that she explain why the hell she is sitting here letting these white supremacists just run roughshod over black people and letting them go and not prosecuting anybody rather than dance the duggy with Hillary Clinton doing his plantation two-step, Roland Martin instead should have been demanding that Hillary Clinton answer the serious questions about the 1996 omnibus crime bill that she did nothing to try to push back during her pathetic tenure in the Senate, didn't say one damn word about it in 25 years, and yet here this peroxide blonde wrinkled up hag has the nerve to come to black people saying you should vote for me i want your vote well hillary there's something on the order of over a million black people behind bars in the united states there's your black support but roland martin didn't do that you want to know why because as far as he's concerned he's playing the game he's playing the game well as the old saying goes when you play the game the game also plays you so Roland Martin, useless as usual, and Richard Spencer was sitting there the whole time practically laughing at old roly-poly because he understood this is not about winning a debate. Roland Martin was sitting there thinking that he was scoring points, and Richard Spencer's like, it doesn't matter. The people who want to hear the white supremacist message, they could give less than a damn whether or not you make me look bad. They could care less whether or not you've got the facts on your side. White supremacy is not about facts. It never has been. Richard Spencer gets that. And Roland Martin's little debate was less than useless. He would have been better off spending his time challenging the people in government who have been sitting here helping the white supremacists to steamroll us. But Roland Martin doesn't do that. In fact, for those of you who have been paying attention to Roly-Poly the last year or so, you know that every time he's gone on his show, he's had a platform for attacking black people, specifically black men. And I'm not just talking about Nate Parker in this case. It seems that there was no incident that Roland Martin 
wasn't prepared to give a full platform to everybody who wants to sit there and say, well, black people need to understand, to understand, black people just need to understand that there's going to be deaths and murders, but only of us. Black people need to understand that we should not expect people who ca attack and kill us to be punished. Black people just need to understand. Yeah, he's got a really platform for that, and he thinks he's going to clean that up simply because he goes to Richard Spencer, somebody who it's okay for him to go ahead and give a shellacking to. Because as we keep telling you, Roland Martin's only objective right now is to get his old job back at CNN. Or perhaps if he thinks he can finagle a position over at MSNBC, hell, he'd go on Fox if he thought that they'd take him. That's what Roland Martin's about these days. He's trying to figure out how to get back into the big leagues. You think he wants to be there in the cable ghetto of TV One? Or TV none, as I like to call them. No, Roland Martin only went ahead and gave Richard Spencer a kicking. And a weak one at that. Because Richard Spencer is a sanctioned target. The good white folks, mostly Jews in the main, who run things at CNN and MSNBC... They don't like Richard Spencer for obvious reasons. The guy's a blatant anti-Semite. So it's okay to go ahead and attack him. But those same people love the Clintons. And it's not okay to attack Hillary. Hell, even if she was a sanctioned target, Roland Martin wouldn't be able to attack her anyway because they just wouldn't like the idea of a black man calling himself challenging his betters. See, it's okay to go after Richard Spencer. Poor white trash doesn't challenge the status quo. But a black person who actually takes Hillary Clinton to task, now that we cannot have. And that's the reason why Jason, that's part of the reason why, there's a dozen others, but that's part of the reason why Jason and I went so hard on Roland Martin's little non-interview with Richard Spencer, because any fool can sit there and criticize a white supremacist and prove that these guys don't know what they're talking about. Hell, even the white supremacists don't make too much hay out of their own credibility. For them, this is ideology. It's like religion. Religion doesn't have to be proven. Nobody sits there and says, don't worry, God's going to show up on next Tuesday morning at 11.45 a.m. in Greenwich, Connecticut. And he's going to explain to you that he's the one and only God. They don't do that. You got to take it all on faith. And for white people, that is exactly what white supremacy should be. It should be impervious to the facts, impervious to reality. It should simply be. It should be immune from having to prove itself. Richard Spencer gets that. Roland Martin doesn't. So I don't want to see any interviews where you're sitting here calling yourself arguing with some white supremacist. You know, outside of an, an admittedly entertainment show like, you know, Trevor Noah, it's okay for him to go ahead and slap Tommy Lauren around. That's okay. Because he's an entertainer. It's a comedy show. But if somebody's ex actually asking me to take it seriously when you go after Richard Spencer, or even freaking Steve Bannon for that matter, sorry, I can't get too emotionally involved in that. Because I'm not interested in arguing with a bunch of dyed-in-the-wool ideologues. What I want to do is to give serious scrutiny to their support structure. And that's where questioning the people in government comes in. You've never seen Roland Martin do that, have you? And he's not going to. Because that would look bad when the good white folks over at CNN have to field his latest phone call uh, in, 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 in chance. Uh, Jeff Zucker, any chance I have my old job back? I, look, uh, I'm willing to apologize on air. You know, hell, I'll, I'll have a gay or lesbian co-host with me. Just, just let me back on. Just let me back on. Just let me back on. And heck, don't think that MSNBC would necessarily be a bad gig. I mean, hell, Rachel Maddow makes something like $7 million a year, I believe. I mean, she gets, she gets millions of dollars for her little show. Again, when's the last time Rachel Maddow has decided that it's time to question the Clintons? When talking about black incarceration, there are certain people who they're willing to talk to and question and others who they dare not at all. 
This is the reason why Richard Spencer didn't give a damn what Roland Martin had to say. He knows the game that he's playing. And you know what? He probably knows that there's a lot of black people who have been dumb enough to play right along with them. Because I've told you for the longest time, black people need to avoid joining up with these white movements. I mean, like, for example, the men's rights, so-called men's rights movement, which is nothing more than a clumsy front for white supremacy. The men's rights bowel movement. They are and have always been a clumsy front for the alt-right. White people create institutions and organizations in order to establish and perpetuate their power, not yours. And this is why black women joining feminism and black men lending their voice to the MRAs is a self-defeating proposition. The lesson that you were supposed to take away from the duplicity of feminism and the MRAs is that white people, whether left or right, they all look at us the same way. What are we going to get out of this black person in front of us? I mean, white women have always known when to stop it with the feminist rhetoric when their interests are at stake. And they did shut up in the mid-70s when white men offered them minority status. And they've done it again with Donald Trump when white males put their foot down with their own women. No matter how rebellious white women act, white people know how to come together when it's time to. And when they come together... Ain't no room at the table for you. See, the MRAs, and we've been warning you about this, when they sat there with their little chants saying, what is sexism? Or what, what is feminism anti-male? What is racism anti-white? These MRAs have been nothing more than just alt-right surrogates. And haven't you noticed that the so-called MRAs have been unusually quiet as of late you want to know why because that's what happens when a front organization is no longer necessary they were an auxiliary of the alt-right the alt-right now has their guy at the top hence they don't need this duplicitous mouthpiece they'll probably still be there in a rhetorical sense but you're gonna find that a lot of the verb and drive for the MRAs is going to be muted. They're going to lose a lot of the spit and vinegar that they used to have. And black men who went along with the MRAs, just out of curiosity, where does this leave you? As Dr. John Henry Clark always said, black people are forever joining things without examining what it is that they're joining. We don't have time to lose chasing wild hares. And those of us in intelligent black society don't have time to waste trying to convince you that the same white people who put our ancestors in chains, who were lynching and raping and killing black men, women, and children, who have renewed their efforts to to oppress and slaughter us in the 21st century, we don't have time to try to convince anybody that these white people haven't changed. Good night. That's a waste of time and we're not going to do it. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and issue a warning to the intelligent and the rest of you are going to be roadkill. You see, we used to have to argue with some black men about the fallacy of the MRA movement. It was obvious to us what it was, but it wasn't so obvious to them. I've already covered this in a previous video. I can sympathize with the black men who feel that, who understand that black men have been run over the coals. Your grievance with black women, not all, but certainly enough, your grievance is justifiable, but we warned you and told you that you were perpetuating and amplifying one tragic mistake with an even greater one. If you go to those MRA websites and those MRA YouTube videos and the podcasts, it's nothing but white supremacist dogma, top to bottom, top to bottom. And if you had anything to do 
with helping to promote their bowel movement, if you had anything to do with speaking up for them or championing their cause, if you had anything to do with arguing the point when we tried to tell you the obvious scam that it was, then you, my friend, get your own engraved permanent seat at the back of the short bus. Because truth be told, all you had to do was be willing to accept the fact that white people do not build organizations to enhance your power. They've never done it. They're not going to. They have no problem sitting here giving lip service to things of interest to black people. They have no problem giving you a pat on the head and saying, hey, this movement kind of has something to do with what you were talking about. Yeah, but they'll never say the words, it's got something to do with you. Because it doesn't. So yet another leg of the alt-right is joining in in the Donald Trump white supremacist homecoming. Oh yeah, they're all coming home. The white supremacists are all coming home. Because this is not merely a homecoming, it is a strategic regrouping. And the only reason that an army regroups is in anticipation of the next major offensive attack that they're going to carry out. And who, I wonder, will be the target of that attack? Do you even have to ask? Since Donald Trump has become the vehicle for the white supremacists' it latest wave, we're going to go ahead and keep special emphasis on him, but there's something else that I want to go ahead and mention, and I really can't emphasize this strongly enough. During the aforementioned interview that Richard Spencer gave that I'm not going to give the location of because I'm not giving them publicity, Richard Spencer was asked by the interviewers about his connection to Donald Trump, and he admitted that for the most part, he didn't have a direct connection to Donald Trump, though he did admire all of Trump's racialist rhetoric. And then Richard Spencer said something very interesting. And it tells you just how devious these bastards are. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, lightly paraphrasing here, he said, in essence, that although he agreed with much of what Donald Trump said, at the end of the day, he was not willing to allow the alt-right to essentially become an auxiliary of the Republican Party, of any political party, and that he wanted the alt-right, the white supremacist group that he's heading up, he wanted for them to have their own power base, their own voice, and that basically these guys had to have a movement that would outlive Donald Trump, no matter how good or bad his presidency turned out to be. And then he said something, I'm going to quote verbatim here, that really, really made my ears perk up. He said, and I quote, The alt-right will not have come into its own until after we have disagreed with Donald Trump. I found that to be very, very interesting. The alt-right will not have come into its own until after we disagree with Donald Trump. You see, Richard Spencer has a vision for his white supremacist movement, and he doesn't intend for it to merely be the tail of the dog. In fact, he doesn't even seem to be interested in being the tail that wags the dog. He wants to be the dog, period. That's what Richard Spencer is after. As far as he's concerned, his movement will not have achieved its fullest potential, its fullest voice, until they have put Donald Trump on notice. He knows that his white supremacist movement is Donald Trump's base. And he's not looking for diet white supremacy. He's not looking for a place for non-whites in America. He's not looking for a political movement that will merely put white people's position first, foremost, and only. 
He wants one that excludes even the possibility of any other outcome. During a prior broadcast with Jason Black, I had told you about the Night of the Long Knives, happened in Germany in 1934. Adolf Hitler wanted to consolidate his power over the Nazi party, and the way that he did it was by having certain members of the Nazi regime themselves killed. The Third Reich's first victims were other Nazis. And Hitler also went after the precursor to the Nazis, or rather, you know, kind of an, uh, an, an adjacent to the Nazis, the NSDAP. And the whole point of the Night of the Long Knives was for Hitler to get rid of anyone who was a critic of his leadership, or who he felt would be able to challenge him for power and leverage and influence over the Nazis. You see, there were individuals there like in the Nazis at that time, like Ernst Rahm, who, like Hitler, was also a World War I veteran. Rahm had a lot of esteem in Germany, and more so in, among the Nazis themselves. And Ernst Rahm was allegedly homosexual. That didn't mean anything to Adolf Hitler. Kind of like Mussolini, you know, was a, supposed to be a devout Catholic, but Hitler didn't care about religion either. He was all about power. Ernst Rahm, although he never disagreed with Adolf Hitler, the problem was Ernst Rahm was very highly respected. And why not? Ernst Rahm had been a decorated officer during the First World War. He rose all the way up to the rank of captain. He had been seriously wounded twice, and he carried he had just terrible scars on his face from what had happened to him during the First World War. And granted, he was paunchy and overweight by the time the 1920s and 30s had rolled around, but the point was he had already shown that he had been battle-tested, battle-proven. So when Ernst Rahm joined the Nazis, he carried a certain amount of weight, no pun intended, that the corporal, and that's what Ernst Rahm and the other military men from the First World War who joined the Nazis like to nickname Hitler, they nicknamed him the the corporal. In other words, making it clear, hey, during the war, while we were officers sending idiots to die, you only got mustard gas because you were one of the idiots who we sent. And don't think that that was lost on Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was carrying grudges from his childhood. He was here, he was a 50-some-odd-year-old man still carrying grudges from his childhood. So you think that it was lost on him that Ernst Rahm was an officer during the war and that Adolf Hitler had been gassed in, in a convalescent home for a while because of it? So there was no way in the world that Hitler was going to allow Ernst Rahm to live. The man had too much importance. The man had too much credibility. Even though he didn't disagree with Adolf Hitler, the problem was that he could have. And if he had disagreed with Hitler, it would have been a problem. Hitler was not looking to have to convince anyone to follow him. He just wanted people to follow, starting with the Nazis. And that's what the Night of the Long Knives was about. It was about the Nazis cleaning house before they decided to attack the rest of the world. And when I hear Richard Spencer say things like, the alt-right will not have come into its own until after we disagree with Donald Trump. That sounds to me like someone sharpening the long knives of their own. Donald Trump might want to be careful. Before this is all over, he might have a couple of daggers sticking out of his back. The white supremacists look at Trump as the useful idiot that he is. He's a vehicle that they can use to raise their own profile. They want to make white supremacy truly legitimate in every way that they can. And hanging on to Trump's presidency is a crucial component of that. That you can have blatant, open, racist, demagogic, hell-bent on genocide, just genocidal racists, who are standing in the Oval Office. Yeah. That's exactly the kind of position that they want. And when I see Donald Trump sitting here saying nothing about it, 
that lets me know that at least in part he's learned that lesson. I mean, he sits here and he talks about everything else. He made that stupid phone call with Taiwan and he can't shut up about it. The carrier deal, which we all know is going to blow up in his face. Those jobs have not been saved. They're moving offshore. It's just been postponed for a while. But he won't shut up about that. But all of a sudden, when it comes time to talk about these white supremacists, Donald Trump, the man who doesn't shut up, suddenly has nothing to say. Very interesting. And you know something else that old President Tangerine has nothing to say about? Russia. You see, I knew when Donald Trump was sitting here heaping praise on Vladimir Putin, I knew that he was sending the dog whistle language to the white supremacist. Then he was echoing white supremacist talking points. In recent years, there has been a love affair that sprouted up between the white supremacists and Russia, of all places, a place that 99% of them have never been to, can't find on a map, and wouldn't go if they had the chance. Trump's adoration for Russia, whether genuine or fake, and I believe that to an extent it is genuine, his adoration for Russia is rooted in a deeply held tenet of the alt-right. Because Vladimir Putin has been attacking the so-called oligarchs. These are men who own major heavy industries in Russia, who just happen to all be Jewish, by the way. You can go on any of these white supremacist websites that you want. Whenever they talk about Russia, they got nothing but praise for Russia. They love Russia. Why? Because Putin has taken it to the oligarchs. He's either imprisoned them or forced them out of the country. That's something that a white supremacist can appreciate. President Tangerine knows when to use code words and when to say nothing at all. Because a lot of you out there going, man, Trump ain't that smart, is he? Well, duh. People who inherit their wealth are usually congenital idiots. And it also explains his being a white supremacist. Yeah, it's the last brain cell in your head that comes up with that one. I mean, a person with an IQ of 50 is a conservative. A person with an IQ of 30 drools on themselves, and a guy with an IQ in the single digits is a white supremacist. They do it because they're stupid and it's easy. White nationalism is easy. You don't even have to think. Just act like a three-year-old who didn't get a cookie and that's pretty much all you need. That Donald Trump would adore Putin is perfectly reasonable for an economic whore like himself, but that would clearly anger Republicans and conservatives, and they don't want any rival strong enough to challenge the U.S. That's their problem with Donald Trump's bromance with Putin. The right wing's so-called idol Ronald Reagan, you know, the senile old bat, he made a career out of demonizing the Russians in the 80s, as I recall. I mean, didn't he sit there and call Russia the evil empire? I do recall something about that. Not that I expect Trump to. I mean, the guy doesn't read. Well, it just goes to show that the old saying is true. That we have no permanent friends, we have no permanent enemies, only permanent interests. Because not so long ago, as far as the Republicans were concerned, Russia's very existence was intolerable to the U.S. Well, that was until the Russians had been militarily and economically subdued. They achieved the economic part, but truth be told, they have yet to achieve the military suppression of Russia. And even though Russia is in a degraded state, they still have the world's largest land mass, huge natural resource reserves, and although their 10,000 nuclear warhead arsenal is highly questionable, I don't think there's any question that even if only 10% of their nukes are still viable, they would inflict unimaginable devastation. Personally, I think the right wing, their whole problem with Trump sitting here cozying up with Putin is that it sets a bad precedent to have a U.S. president who's making overtures to the Russians. I mean, hell, if anything, I guess they figure the Russians ought to be making overtures to the U.S. And by reaching out to the Russians, Trump is pretty much telegraphing that America will be following the Kremlin's lead. And yet, for some strange reason, 
you would think the white supremacists would have a problem with these Eurasians, which is what the Russians are. Hell, all the Europeans are Eurasians. Europe is an artificial continent. You got water on two sides. How the hell are you supposed to have water on all four? How the hell are you going to be a proper continent when you ain't got but water on two sides? Yet another lie that white people keep telling. But the white supremacists, they loved it when Trump was sitting there cozying up to Putin. He didn't need to spell it out. He didn't need to go into detail. Sitting here talking about Putin being a strong leader. He didn't mention anything about Chechnya. Not really. I mean, I think he gave like one minor passing mention to it, maybe. You know, kind of a blink and you'll miss it afterthought. But mostly Trump was using the same type of laudatory talking points that the white supremacists use on their websites and message boards and podcasts when talking about Putin. The fact that he would do it that way and that they were able to pick up on that, it does, of course, lend credibility to the idea that these guys are indeed all working in collusion. No kidding. But it also says something else. Even if they're not working in collusion, it would actually be more impressive because black people need you to spell it out for them. And even then, there's all sorts of disagreement about what the simplest of statements means. Communication has become something of a stumbling block to us as of late. And we've suffered mightily as a result. But the white supremacists have made a cause celeb out of Russia. You might want to read some of the... It, well, if you got the air sickness bag on standby, you might want to read some of the garbage that they write, see some of the language that they use, and see how Donald Trump echoed a lot of it. They picked up the dog whistle language, and they were meant to. And people are looking at Trump and it's like, how bizarre. Well, of course they think it's bizarre. I mean, at a time when Russia is on the march, it makes no sense for any U.S. president to be praising Putin, especially when the rest of the world is condemning him. However, in a world where the global number of whites is declining, where white people are looking at the very real possibility that they're simply not going to have enough pale males running around to be able to hold on to what they've stolen, it makes perfect sense. White people have to stick together. It's the unspoken understanding here. It's certainly the understanding that made it where Michael Slager was able to beat the rap. Though thanks to Richard Spencer and his degenerate pals, it's already been said numerous times. Now I know this might be going off in the weeds a little bit. Some of you might look at it as being off topic. But I want to get a little bit deeper into this whole thing with the alt-right's love affair with Russia. And how, more than likely, as with everything else, they are mistaken. And what I think are going to be the seeds of their destruction that they're sowing even now. Because, as with pretty much everything else, the alt-right's committing a lot of mistakes here. And I think that the worst mistake of all is that they're making assumptions. They're assuming that Vladimir Putin's goals are the same as theirs, or at the very least, they're assuming that his goals are not going to come into conflict with theirs in any significant way. That the enemy of your enemy is also your friend. They're assuming that white supremacists can cooperate with one another when their very philosophy makes that impossible. White supremacy was invented to justify the Europeans' taking of other people's land, resources, and lives. It's an ideology of pure theft, and there's no honor among thieves. So, I think before it's all over, these same scumbags who are sitting here, making bedroom eyes at each other, as usual, they're going to be at one another's throats. That's a cheery thought, isn't it? Two groups of narcissistic, unrealistic, myopic morons armed with 10,000 nuclear warheads apiece. And before it's all over, they're going to have a falling out. I'm sure this story will have a happy ending. But either way, for black people, it's going to be cold comfort that the white supremacists do themselves in. And truth be told, most of you, and this is a... This is perhaps a address that I need to get around to finishing one of these days. What are you going to do 
when white supremacy falls, most of you would starve. Like Dr. John Henrik Clark's proposed, though never written, manuscript for his proposed book, The Role of the Bastard as a Factor in World History, my would-be address about what are you going to do when white supremacy falls, it's my own unfinished dream project. I keep promising myself that I am going to finish it, but never quite get to it. But I see the alt-right as with all the other European schemes and dreams, you know, if these guys weren't so damn crooked, if they weren't a bunch of liars, if they weren't so conceited, if they were not inherently self-destructive, they actually could build some stuff that would endure. But the white lifestyle, the white civilization, white culture is not about permanence. It's not about endurance. It's about take what you can when you can. White culture is all about moral relativism and situational ethics. Point blank. I don't give a damn if it's Richard Spencer or Rachel Maddow. Get over it, okay? Black people need to get realistic about this. White supremacy will not go away on its own. The Roman Empire didn't go away on its own. It had to be made to go away. And the same way that the first wave of Europeans who came stumbling and bumbling into Africa didn't go away until the Moors invaded Europe and pushed the bastards back, so these European barbarians are not going to be stopped unless we organize ourselves to fight them and defeat them, and we must fight them on every level. We must fight them politically, fight them economically, fight them militarily, Fight them ideologically, across the board, a non-stop assault. And that doesn't mean praying. It doesn't mean marching, unless marching means you take up arms marching toward the battlefield. That, that kind of marching you can do. And it also doesn't mean trying to get sympathy from them. In fact, it doesn't even mean talking to them. It means creating institutions and organizations that will protect us and beyond that project the force necessary to face these bastards down and to crush their oppressive engine of racial domination. We are not going to put an end to white supremacy until we have finally put a complete and conclusive end to white power itself. Eliminate white power and you will have eliminated white supremacy. That begs the question, do we have the ability to? No. But truth be told, even if we had the ability to, it would mean very little because we lack the will to. Well, a lot of you lack the will to. Those of us in intelligent black society, we got will in reserve. And we're going to need it. So as Donald Trump goes about assembling his American Nazi high command, this Fourth Reich, black people have got their work cut out for us. I'm not going to ask you to sit here boo-hooing, singing the blues, and crying tears for those who are going to die. The truth of the matter is, we have been negligent to assemble our power and to consolidate our influence and to build a black economy that could have headed these bastards off. So since we didn't bother to do that, there's a price to be paid and we're going to pay it. But the truth of the matter is, this is going to turn out to be, in the aggregate, if we do what we're supposed to do, this will actually turn out to be a good thing in the aggregate. Because there's a lot of black people who, truth be told, need to be separated from us. A lot of chaff that needs to be separated from the wheat. And the white supremacists are going to do that. The same way that the white supremacists are going to make conditions so arduous and so oppressive that it will put an end to the debates that we've been having to wage. A lot of black people who have been sitting there thinking to themselves that it's all a game and they'll get attention by being contrary for the sake of being contrary, the white supremacists are going to be the ones who charge the fee for that. And the fee will not be life, it will be death. The white supremacists can actually be useful to us, so long as we make certain that we have insulated our position. I mean, truth be told, there's something on the order of half to probably, and this is probably um, not much of an exaggeration, we could have fully something on the order of two-thirds. That's two out of three 
black people in the United States who are absolutely useless to black empowerment. I don't mean merely useless in that they are not fueling black empowerment right now. I mean, they can't be made to do it in the future. So we're not going to be fighting to convince anyone of anything. The white supremacists are going to do their job, which is to destroy. And the black people who have been sitting here telling themselves of the love of Jesus is going to touch the white supremacists' hearts. If you just sit there and show this white man you don't mean him no harm, then he won't hurt you. Those morons are the first ones to go on the chopping block. And as Jason Black likes to say, this is good. Richard Spencer is out there spreading the gospel of mighty whitey and emboldening the white supremacists being their mouthpiece, attracting adherents. And truth be told, from our position, we are doing the same. This is going to be a war, and we can win it. But we're not winning anything unless we know who the hell the players are. Who are the guys on the opposing army? The guys who we need to be keeping an eye on. Keep track of these guys. You need to know who they are. And make no mistake, this is not going to be a war that ends with negotiations at the peace table.